album. Almost. Michael Jackson and Billie Jean. You're with BBC Radio Counts just coming up to half past ten. Good morning. If you suffer from chronic pain or a long-term illness like Crohn's or multiple sclerosis, would you consider taking cannabis to alleviate some of the pain and distress? With the fact that it's a Class B drug which carries a penalty of up to five years in prison if you're caught possessing it, would that put you off? You may remember a call we took on the big phone in last week. We were talking about back pain. And Rick from Wigmore called in about what he found helped him deal with severe pain. Cannabis, that's the way forward. I've, I know it's illegal, I've never taken a drug before in my life, not one that the government says that we can't have. Uh, it doesn't all work, there's certain strains that have worked for me. How do you take it? On a little machine that vapes it into like a vapour. What does it do for you? It relaxes the body, I get a good night's sleep. It works. How does it make you feel that you have to go and buy an illegal drug? It's like... wrong. It's really wrong. Uh, my daughter can go into the off-licence, buy a bottle of vodka and be dead by the morning. Um, but I can't smoke a little bit of cannabis to help my back. That was Rick's call. A new report by the Drugs Policy Reform Group, Clear, has brought together research it claims demonstrates cannabis can be used safely and effectively to treat a range of medical conditions. Clear is campaigning for cannabis to be allowed on prescription. And Peter Reynolds, who put the report together, joins us now. Peter, good to have you with us on BBC Radio Kent. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Um, Tell me a, a little bit about the conditions that you now believe cannabis can help with. Uh, well, there's a, there's a very wide range of conditions that cannabis can help with, um, and uh, it's not a question of belief, it's a question of evidence. Um, evidence from people's own experience, but, but perhaps more important in terms of getting the policy changed, evidence from respected scientists, doctors and researchers who've actually tested cannabis on certain conditions uh, using the most stringent form of testing, that is double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials. Um, and, and really the reason that we put this report together was to, to knock on the head once and for all this myth that using cannabis as medicine is, is a bit of a joke, um, because it isn't a bit of a joke. And as you very clearly heard from the recording you just played, you know, it provides tremendous relief to some people. We focused on five conditions, Alzheimer's, chronic pain, Crohn's, um, cancer, and multiple sclerosis, because those are the conditions where the evidence is strongest. Um, but there are many other conditions for which cannabis can be effective, uh, and, and we now understand this uh, because we, we understand what we've understood since 1988 mm. that everybody's body has something in it called the endocannabinoid system, which is controlled by microscopic substances called endocannabinoids, which are in fact equivalent to the chemicals in the cannabis plant. And so this explains why, for we know, we know from archaeological evidence, for at least 10,000 years. Mankind has been using cannabis for medicinal purposes, and yet we're in this crazy situation where just since 1971 in this country, we banned cannabis completely and said it has no medicinal value, even though there's so much evidence that points okay. exactly the opposite Peter, direction. Peter, tell us a little bit about how your research worked. Were you reviewing previous research rather than conducting new oh, yes, studies? Absolutely. This, this is a review of the, of the existing literature. Mm. So in other words, you, you know, I, I'm not a scientist. In fact, I, I failed my science O-levels at school. So, but, so what I was doing here was reviewing the scientific evidence that has been published by, as I said, respected scientists, mm. doctors and researchers okay. from all across and, the world. And is there, uh, th- these trials I imagine vary, and I wonder if there is some trials that show that there is uh, that don't endorse the use of cannabis and some that in- endorse it very strongly. So how did you decide which trials to look at? Well, I mean, inevitably, um, when, when you're putting together a report like this, you, have to, you, you can't include all the evidence. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence. That the, 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 the worst evidence you get about cannabis as medicine is that it's not very effective. And, for instance, we recently saw in the U.S. that Sativex, the, the only legal form of cannabis available in this country, actually didn't pass its phase three trials for cancer pain. Um, but, I mean, the important thing about cannabis is that even if it doesn't work for people, even if it can't be shown to work, then it's very, very unlikely to cause them any harm. Cannabis is much safer, much less toxic 
than most of the thera- most of the pharmaceutical mm-hmm. medicines which people will be prescribed. Okay. We've we've had people on this program talk about some very serious um, mental health impacts of cannabis, and and in particular certain strains of cannabis. Presumably, that needs to be taken into account when you're talking about how the cannabis is administered for these um, health conditions. So, are we talking here about people making their own minds up, buying their own cannabis, and using it in their own way, or are you looking at a particular drug that has cannabis in it? And you mentioned Sativex. Well, what, what we believe should, should happen is that uh, doctors should prescribe medicinal cannabis. Um, and, and there are plenty of doctors in this country ready to do that. In fact, some already doing it, even though they're breaking the law. Um, and the, the, the way they do it is they prescribe a product that is available in Holland, grown under the auspices of the Dutch government, called Bedrican. There are, in fact, five different products that they produce. Um, and, and this product is exported and shipped all over Europe, and, in fact, as far away as Canada. Canada nowadays, uh, and as I say, it's brought, regulated by the Dutch government. It's you know irradiated after it's grown to make sure it controls no, it contains no harmful pests or mildew or mould. And we could start importing this for people in this country tomorrow if the government would simply agree that if a doctor prescribes cannabis, then people should be able to have access to it. Okay. So this, this is a safe, properly regulated version of cannabis that people could be getting tomorrow if only the government would mm. relent. You, you mentioned Alzheimer's, and I'm intrigued. One of my colleagues who has a, a relative uh, with uh, Alzheimer's, her eyebrows nearly went through the roof when we mentioned this today. Mm. How would someone with Alzheimer's handle taking cannabis? Well, the, the, the evidence on Alzheimer's and all forms of dementia is absolutely extreme. Extraordinary. Um, and, and cannabis is well known as a neuroprotectant. In other words, it protects the brain against damage. The U.S. government, in fact, has held a patent on cannabis for about 15 years now for its use in treatment for post-stroke therapy to prevent the damage from a stroke getting any worse. And this is the, the way that it can help with Alzheimer's. It can help. The, the reason Alzheimer's is caused by the development of a substance called amyloid plaque in the brain. Mm. And the research shows that THC, one of the principal active ingredients in cannabis, slows the development of amyloid plaque more effectively than any pharmaceutical medicine. And there's uh, Professor Gary Wink from Ohio State University says quite categorically now that in his view, if you use cannabis on, on a moderate basis from middle age onwards, you, you will not develop Alzheimer's, or at least you'll, you'll slow the development of it to the point where you'll probably die before, in fact, you, you, can, you achieve that condition. Let's um, focus on one of the conditions, and I hope you'll stay with us, Peter. I want to bring in Nick Riker. Nick is the Director of Policy and Research from the MS Society. Nick, good to have you with us. Good morning good to morning. you. What do you make of Peter's study? Um, well, I mean, there are diverse option, views really on cannabis. There's the really hard line that says um, no cannabis product should be made available at all. It should just be illegal. And then there's the complete opposite view, which I think Peter takes, which is uh, in a sense a much more free-for-all. That cannabis should just be made more freely available. But there's, there are many stages in between there. And even if you were to say that people shouldn't be prosecuted for attempting to use cannabis to treat their condition, how would you seek to protect them as consumers is the big question. So um, should companies be only be licensed to grow cannabis uh, of a particular strain for medicinal purposes? Should that be to pharmaceutical standards? Should then the, the way the cannabis is extracted and turned into a product that's sold go through all of the normal processes of medicine review and manufacture? And the real shame, in a way, is that one company has gone through all of that. So they have produced the Sativex spray, which is based on a mix of two cannabis plants. It's been proven to be effective in the treatment of of spasticity in MS, which is that really painful muscle cramping. But that product, Sativex, is not being made available through the NHS. Mm. Is it legal to take it in this country, but not available on the NHS? It's it's legal to take Sativex, so it's a licensed medicine. It's been approved by the European Union. Um, You can get it through the NHS in Wales. You can't get it through the NHS in the rest of the UK. And what we really want is for NICE and the equivalent bodies in Scotland and Northern Ireland Mm. to just take a really comprehensive look at the evidence. And we're confident that if they do that, they will make Sativex broadly available. If you wanted to buy it, how much would it cost you? Uh, well, it, it, 
inevitably is for an individual it depends a little bit on how much you then need okay. but, but typically it would cost people about six pounds mm. a day and do any people with ms do that uh, very small numbers of people with ms um buy sativex there would be a much i mean not enormous numbers but there would be a larger number of people that stand mm. to benefit if it was made available properly looking at the forums on the ms society website there are some ms sufferers recommending it to each other it, it seems curious to me that they might be driven to something that is not available on the NHS or even driven to taking cannabis in a form that is illegal is that because the alternatives aren't that good well uh, spasticity is really hard to treat uh, ultimately one of the one of the major consequences of MS is that people have these really painful muscular spasms and there isn't easy treatment options unfortunately and that's why people um, are passionate about what cannabis might be able to offer them and for us the really sensible route is that there is a medicine available derived from cannabis and that should be available and people shouldn't have to look at the illegal options and all of what that exposes mm. them to by having to go to um, all sorts of dubious buyers on the high street do you have any concerns about the impact of cannabis on mental health well, th I think the evidence is mixed and one of the problems with the clinical trials that have been done on the use of cannabinoids and, and MS, for example, is that they tend to be quite short and so the long-term um, cost-benefit in terms of mental health is poorly understood and what we really want is a broad scientific review that pulls people in from multiple conditions, from the Home Office, from the Department of Health, to really have a considered look at the evidence and then to reach um, a, a new position, whatever that is. Let's just go back to Peter Reynolds for a moment we we're hearing quite a lot about Sativex there is that a drug that you would endorse or I mean you mentioned another one was it Bedrican? Yes no, no, I mean mm. I fully endorse and support what Nick says I mean Nick and I have met and talked about this and to see if we can find a way through it because I mean it really is an absurd situation where the government has been telling people for many years no you can't use cannabis you must wait until the pharmaceutical version comes out if you like and now the pharmaceutical version has come out and they're refusing to prescribe it but the reason they're refusing to prescribe it is because they say it's not cost effective and the alternative product which which we we, we are suggesting bedrican costs the equivalent same cannabinoid content as you get in sativex you can get for between five percent and twenty percent of the price if you use bedrican so you know we do not um, endorse a free-for-all about cannabis at all we endorse a strictly regulated regime and in terms of medicinal cannabis that means prescribed by a doctor mm -hmm. now there are all sorts of possibilities and opportunities to regulate as, as nick hinted at but to begin with bedrican cannabis regulated by an eu government is available now and we could start people who are in severe pain suffering from the sort of conditions we've talked about could have access to that tomorrow if the government would simply agree to issue import licenses to people whose doctors want to prescribe it It'll be interesting to see what happens and which government we have and whether there is an appetite for this uh, after <laughs> after the first week of may peter it's really interesting to talk to you thank you for your time and nick likewise to you nick Riker. thank you both very much indeed for your explanations this morning you're listening to bbc radio ken coming up we'll hear from a listener who's been touched by our debate about cannabis and self-medication don't go anywhere it is a story about the naivety of youth right now we're talking about cannabis an interesting discussion just now talking about medicinal cannabis talking about whether or not it should be available on the nhs nathaniel in dover was listening nice to have you with us nathaniel how are you yeah, I'm not bad, thank you. I just wish it was a tad warmer this morning, to be honest. You're what, um, sorry? I just wish it was a tad warmer Oh, a bit more like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. beautiful. It was a lovely day. Nathaniel, you were listening with interest because your dad yes. used cannabis to medicate. Why did he use cannabis to medicate? Um, because he, back in 2011, he had, well, from a run-up in from about 2010 up to 2011, he had a run-in of different medical problems, which eventually ended up with him passing away due to cancer of the bones, lung and liver um, back in 2011. He also had a couple of strokes back in 2010 and a couple of heart attacks back in 2009 as well. So he had a right run of the mill, mm. uh, the, uh, the illnesses. And when I, I was, I was 20, 19, 20 years old at the time and living with him and I came across it um, he had some cannabis in the house and my initial reaction wasn't actually I wasn't thinking about you know it's to sort his pain mine was the oh he's got drugs in the house it's wrong it's not right it's 
completely unacceptable sort of mm. attitude towards it. And, and, and Nathaniel, really interesting, we jump in for a moment, really interesting because exactly the opposite, a sort of role reversal of what you would anticipate and of what we've heard on the phone in many times about a parent finding their teenagers' drugs in the house and yeah. having exactly that reaction. So there you were, almost sort of your roles reversed. Yeah, that's right, you know. Um, I, I think it's because I had... Uh, I, I, because of the education I had at school was always focused on all this sort of thing and you know in hindsight I wish I actually let him carry on because watching him deteriorate like he did and watching him on the floor literally on the floor rolling in agony on the floor because of the tumours or, or, or whatever um, they're, they're, I should have let him carry on medicating because then he might have had an easier time up until his eventual passing when did when you discovered the cannabis what was did you have a big confrontation then what happened i did i went mad at him about it um if i'm being honest i um i said what are you doing you know you're better you know this isn't the answer sort of attitude towards it i didn't want to listen to what he had to say and i threw it in the bin um i i, I just did not want to have any of it um, even though he was trying to explain to me, it's because because he had it on his uh, on his bones. His back is where it all was, and he was saying about the, it sorts of back pain, relaxes the muscles, and stuff like that. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to hear it. I shout, you know, and I was really angry about it. Um, so and when and when you hear now people like Peter Reynolds and Nick Riker talking about it, mm. did you? <sighs> Do you wish you'd reacted differently? Do you wish yes. you'd had a bit um, more? Yeah, absolutely. I reg I, like I said, that was one of my biggest regrets was letting him. Because I feel like now that as a result of me being like that, it actually and it, it sort of went towards him suffering in pain a little bit. And then he turns to m medicated morphine um, prescribed by the hospices and prescribed by the NHS. And then watching him on morphine, not having a clue where he is, what he's doing in cloud cuckoo land, I think was just a thousand times worse, to be honest with you, because he didn't even know who I was, you know, mm. uh, didn't know who my mum was, um, sort of thing. And he was, it, you know, that was probably 10 times worse than what the other, uh, than what cannabis could, would have done for him. And I, after that happened, I went and did a bit of research for myself, started looking at studies, what had been taking place in the univ various universities and this new up and coming thing, people talking about cannabis based oils rather than actually smoking it through tobacco form yes. and realizing that I was like, oh, I, you know, yeah. had I known about this, that would have been, you know, I, I then realised actually there is some medicinal purposes towards it. You know, I've never been for, I've always been against sort of any form of recreational drug use, um, to be honest. But in mm. this sort of instance, if someone's suffering in pain and there's a, there's an option out there, then mm. I think it's just a matter of that it's selfish of um, our society to say they can't have it because it's it, it's one of those difficult um, moral uh, questions which will always be asked I think there will always be people for and against it but we we should be allowing people in pain to have something to ease that pain which you know and because at the moment the only reason they're banning it in my opinion is because pharmaceutical companies will struggle to make a profit from medicine, medicinal related cannabis that's my personal opinion on it Nathaniel I'm really interested in your story and I really admire you for having to revisit your own your own position on it. It must have been mm. extremely challenging what you went through with your dad. And to go yeah. away afterwards and look into it and do all of that, I just think takes real guts. Thank you for your call this morning. It's no, really no problem at all. Lovely to talk with you. That was Nathaniel in Dover, the story of his dad and his dad's use of cannabis, which he was really angry about at the time.